Good afternoon, and welcome to another edition of Facebook Live uh, at Chisholm, Chisholm, and Kilpatrick. My name is Christian McTarnigan. I'm an attorney here at the firm. Today, joining me to talk about CMP examinations is Jenna Zelmer, who is also an attorney, and Michael Lestrato, who is another attorney at the firm. So I think we're just going to jump right in. First question, what is a CMP exam? What do I mean when I'm saying that? Yeah, Christian. So CMP stands for Compensation and Pension Examination, and it's the exam that uh, VA will order when it's deciding a veteran's claim for service connection or for an increased rating for your disability. So is there any problem that veterans should be aware of if the VA deny a claim without getting a medical examination at all? Um, well, so no, not necessarily. So VA is allowed to deny a claim without getting an exam. Um, Generally, for a service connection claim, um, we we say it's a really low threshold for getting an exam. But in certain uh, circumstances, VA doesn't have to get an exam. Um, usually, if you are trying to get a service connection claim, the VA is going to need to get an exam uh, to determine what the cause of your condition is and to determine whether or not it's related to service. Um, and so, in order to get an exam in that scenario, there has to be at least some evidence that indicates your disability is related to service somehow. So, if you're if there's no evidence that your disability is not related to service, VA can deny your claim without getting an exam. Um, but for the most part, in most, I would say 90% of cases, VA is going to get an exam either to determine whether or not your service connect or whether or not your disability is related to service so that they can grant service connection or whether to determine if your already service connected disability warrants a higher rating. It's gotten worse. So let's say a veteran has filed for service connection for uh, a left knee condition and a psychological condition. Would they get two separate exams for those two separate disabilities? Yes, so they're gonna get two separate exams because the medical question is a little bit different uh, based on whatever disability you have. And so um, for the knee disability, they would probably get some sort of orthopedic doctor. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a doctor, it can be a nurse practitioner or um, a physician's assistant, but um, that, that physician, that uh, medical professional will be focused on the orthopedic condition. Whereas if there's a psychiatric disability, then they're going to get a psychiatric professional. So you just sort of alluded to this. The exams can be conducted by a medical doctor or sort of uh, some other sufficient uh, qu sufficiently qualified person, right? Right, and usually um, there are VA uh, medical professionals, but every once in a while, VA will also um, contract out with a third party professional. And so um, sometimes it's a private examiner who's not affiliated with VA, but just has a contract with VA. Okay. Would those exams be any different than a VA conducted exam? No, so there are something called um, disability benefits questionnaires, um, but for the most part, the exams, regardless of whether or not they're conducted by VA or by um, a third party uh, contractor, they're supposed to be answering the same questions. The forms that they're on might be a little bit different. Um, a DBQ is a disability benefits questionnaire. It's mostly just a form that uh, the professional can fill out check boxes, um, provide some sort of narrative, but um, the, the contents of the exam should be the same regardless. So if a veteran has filed the service connection claim and VA decides to get them an examination, how important is that examination? It's really important. So in most cases, um, we're dealing with pretty complex medical issues and so VA is going to require some sort of medical evidence in order to um, properly adjudicate the veteran's claim and hopefully grant service connection or grant a higher rating and so it's really important that uh, the veterans go to their exams. It's incredibly important. Um, so that was just a little by way of background and now uh, we're going to move into a discussion of some of the do's and don'ts of VA examination. So I'm going to start with Mike. Um, What's something that you would recommend a veteran do in one, relationship to a CMP exam? Sure. One of the most important things for veterans to do is when they relay their symptoms to the CMP examiner, um, it's to just be honest. Um, you know, there is a record of medical records from the past that the adjudicator will take a look at in addition to the result of the CMP exam. Um, so it's very important that whatever you state doesn't conflict with something maybe that has been already recorded in the past. So, um, you know, it's extremely important for the veteran to be honest, and that means not 
downplaying the symptoms as well. Mm -hmm. So if a veteran's condition truly has worsened, he or she should state that and um, make sure that it's recorded properly for VA to know. Um, you know, if things are, um, if things that the veteran knows have happened previously in the file, they, sh they feel free to reiterate those things. But it's, like I said before, it's really important that they don't conflict maybe something that they said in the past with something that they are saying now, provided, of course, that the situation hasn't changed. Sure. Or there's not some sort of explanation for that, mm -hmm. right? When I'm looking at my client's yeah. files, I notice something changes. I'm really hoping that there's a reason why that I can use to try to help explain why it's not inconsistent. Because I think that's what you're getting at. VA will look for inconsistencies mm -hmm. in the veteran's story um, to, 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 dis to do a number of things and, and sometimes deny the claim. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like, like I said, be expressive. And um, if your condition truly has worsened, it's, it's perfectly acceptable to say that and, in fact, would help your case if you are to relay that information to the CMP examiner so they can record it properly. Mm -hmm. So um, what should the CMP examiners know? Is Should the veteran go into the room assuming that the, that the examiner knows everything about their case? Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, this is really not an opportunity to ask about the status of your case. Mm -hmm. um, the CMP examiner, I'm sure, has a lot of examinations that they're doing on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. They don't really have any unique knowledge about any specific veteran's case. They in all likelihood haven't reviewed anything in the file, um, which is another reason why it's important for veterans to go in and um, be expressive, say what's going on, and make sure that the CMP examiner is recording things that they're saying. Yeah. Um, because if it's not recorded, it's tough to prove that it ever actually happened mm -hmm. during that examination. Absolutely. Um, so. One thing that we also want to highlight is it's really important to attend these examinations, right? Oh, absolutely. In our practice here, um, we've unfortunately seen VA deny, um, whether it be service connection or a claim for an increased rating, solely based on the fact that the veteran did not attend their most recently scheduled CMP examination. Um, and so it's really critical that even if the veteran's afraid of what the result may be, that they attend the exam because VA will oftentimes view a veteran that has missed the exam or refused to go to exam as low-hanging fruit and kind yeah. of just a, a quick way to mm -hmm. um, you know, deny the claim and move mm -hmm. on to the next veteran. Yeah. And in some instances, that would be a completely legal right. result. Um, VA has the right to deny service connection claims and things like that if a veteran fails, or, or increased rating claims if the veteran fails to attend the examination. Right. So okay. one point I want to make before we move on to some of the thoughts that Jenna has is, this isn't your treating doctor, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, they're there to evaluate whether your condition was caused by service or how severe it is at that point in time. Um, so a common thing that I see in some of my cases is, especially in the psychological uh, evaluation context, so how are you doing today, Mr. X? Oh, I'm doing well. Common pleasantry, first thing reported in the examination. Veteran states he's doing well. Mm -hmm. um, so. You know, obviously be cordial, <laughs> be polite, um, but you know, just know that everything you say in there is going to be recorded in that examination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point because it's oftentimes hard to put things into context, you know, a few years down the road Absolutely. if you need to review the exams when you may have been yeah. saying something, not even thinking that's the way it's going yeah. to be written down or in intended yeah. for it to be put down. I had a fantastic day at my yep. niece's birthday party, <laughs> right? And, and it's just opening up the conversation, but then you have mm -hmm. that as an advocate five, 10, 15 years later, um, and you don't understand that that was just common pleasantries. It's hard right. to see that from, a, from the file itself. And, and it's 100% accurate. Yeah. And VA really puts a lot of weight on their own exams. Yep. Damn. And so despite the fact that the veteran can maybe pr provide outside medical opinions um, or outside medical evidence, VA really holds um, the exams that they provide um, kind of in high esteem, if you will. Yes. And so it's, it's very important that you attend them and that you know you think carefully about how you say things and what you say and how you express your symptoms when you attend an exam. Mm -hmm. And I think so what an overarching theme that we, we've kind of touched on is the fact that VA has this duty to assist a veteran mm -hmm. in substantiating his or her claim. And so that's why VA is getting these examinations. Um, but, you know, as part of that duty, what VA will often say is that that duty is not a one-way street. And what yeah. that means is that, you know, if a veteran is afforded an opportunity to go to an examination and they don't attend, that's what VA is going to use. They are, they're going to say, well, we... we 
completed our part of the duty to assist, but veterans still have their own obligations to meet us halfway um, and actually come to the exam and provide, you know, information about their claim. And so that kind of all goes back, you know, even though v it's VA's duty, um, you know, the best thing that you can do as a veteran is to make VA's job as easy as possible. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, Don't give the them exam. a reason exactly. to deny the claim. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, that's the duty assist. But <clears throat> where are you going to... Well, just some other thoughts that you might have, Jenna, about um, things that veterans should be aware of. Yeah. So I think it's really important to kind of understand what the context of the exam is. Um, so, you know, we mentioned yeah. before, is this an examination for an orthopedic condition? Is this an examination for um, PTSD or another mm -hmm. psychiatric disability? And it's also important to know, are you claiming service connection or are you claiming an increased rating? Because the focus of the exams are going to be different in all of those different contexts. So, yeah. um, you know, for example, if you're trying to get service connection for a left knee disability, you're going to go to some medical professional who hopefully hopefully has some sort of orthopedic background, mm -hmm. hopefully is the key word there. Um, and I think we're going to get to that in a little bit. But, um, you know, and that examiner, because it's a service connection claim, is going to be focused on what happened to you in service, you know, what's been going on since yep. service, um, and, you know, trying to figure out what the cause of this uh, left knee or right knee or whatever orthopedic condition it is. Um, and that's going to be a little bit different than if you were going for an increased rating claim because an increased rating claim, the doctor isn't really going to be concerned about what happened to you in service. Um, and if you want to get into that, the doctor is probably going to refocus you. And so um, a lot of times veterans are you know, upset because they feel that the examiner isn't uh, listening to them or isn't really concerned about you know their, their service history but the sure. folk the the real focus of the exam in that case is what the current condition is not really what the past was about it's not that they don't care what happened to you in service yeah. it's that it's not what your claim is about right then and mm -hmm. there and you're sort of wasting precious minutes that you right. have to sort of tell your story if you're focused on something that's not pertinent. Yeah. Right. So it's really important to kind of understand going into it, you know, uh, figure out what what condition you're, you know, this particular exam is for, because a lot of times veterans have multiple different yep. conditions and, you know, they might get them confused. They might think they're going for one exam and they're actually going for another. Or some on the same day. Exactly. Yeah. And so just kind of write down everything that you want the examiner to know about that particular condition, about why you think it's really Related to service, why you think it's worsened, you know, why you think you are deserving of a higher rating, um, and make sure that the the examiner has that in mind when they're asking the questions. And you can kind of, you know, hopefully try to direct the exam in the way that you want it to go. Mm -hmm. You know, you are you, as the uh, examinee, um, you know, you can, you know, volunteer a lot of information that the examiner might not otherwise ask. And so, um, it's really important to be prepared. And so you've been we've been talking a lot about sort of symptoms in this whole discussion. Is that the only thing that's important in the context of, um, let's say, an increased rating a claim? No. Did you want to take it? I was just going to say <laughs> it's also important for the veteran to really relay how the symptom um, impacts their their daily work life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just maybe their daily life in general. And so it, it's really important to link. You know, I have increased pain in my knee. And therefore, I'm unable to lift, I'm unable to walk, mm -hmm. those things. Taking it that next step to show really how the disability impacts um, you know the, the daily, you know daily aspects of life, or right. And if eventually you stopped working because of your yep. disability, yep. that's definitely really important to um, to volunteer in the exam too. Or how it impacts work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even if you didn't stop working, but if yep. it limits your ability to work certain types of jobs, you know, if you can only work a certain amount of days mm -hmm. um, or hours in the day, things like that. Yep. And I, just a practical tip, I think it's perfectly acceptable for you to you know, go in with a list of things, of questions oh, you want to ask, yeah. things that you want to make sure that you say. Um, a lot of complaints that we hear from veterans, they're surprised at how quickly their exam goes yes. yeah. and how they weren't really able to convey everything that they wanted to convey. So I would yep. always recommend veterans go in with a list of things they want to um, hit specifically with the examiner and make sure that before the examiner leaves the room, you've covered everything that mm -hmm. you want to. It's, it's your exam. Make sure you cover everything that you want to convey to the examiner. Exactly. So what's a way, Jenna, that you as a veteran or a veteran can make sure that what they've conveyed was actually put down on the paper? Right. So veterans are entitled to a copy of the examination. And so um, after you go to the exam, you can write to your regional office and request a copy of the exam and you can read 
exactly what the examiner wrote um, and what VA is reading when they're deciding your claim. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, when you look at that exam, that's when, you know, having that list that Mike suggested is really important because you can see, oh, I told the examiner this, but the examiner didn't write it down. Yep. Or I told the examiner X and he actually wrote down Y. And so you can, you know, compare the two um, and make sure that whatever the examiner is reporting to VA, which is what VA is going to, you know, use in deciding the claim and, as Mike said, hold in really high esteem, you want to make sure that all of that information is accurate. Yep. Um, and so if, you know, um, if it's not accurate, then the examiner or the veteran, excuse me, can write um, to their regional office and dispute everything yep. that the examiner said, um, you know, and say, this is what the examiner said and this is why it's wrong. Or the examiner said, you know, I had flare ups once a month. I actually have them twice a month or once a week or something sure. like that, yeah. you know, just to make sure that VA has all of the information before it, before it makes its decision. Yeah. And as an, uh, and as an advocate, uh, when your case gets to court or mm -hmm. when you're making arguments at the agency, those sort of responses can be incredibly helpful yes. um, to help correct the record or supplement the record or anything like that. I know when I'm, I, I work in our court practice and so when I'm appealing a case to court and I'm trying to attack an examination, I've had some clients that have had some really detailed responses that have really been the basis of, of the arguments that I'm mm -hmm. going to make. And it's also what's most important for them, which I think is really helpful to understand sort of what really affects this person day to day because of their their service connected disability yeah mm -hmm. that's a great point and um, you know I think it's important for veterans to resp respond to the exam as soon as they can um, once they receive a copy of it it's fresh in your mind at that point um, and it also shows when you're looking at a record that could be several years old right. that the veteran responded within the first couple weeks after the exam pointing out that you know this this was this is not accurate um, this is different this wasn't conveyed that way Sure. Um, and so I think just uh, responding to those exams is always a good idea. Mm -hmm. So what are some other thoughts, Mike, that you have, some advice you have for, um, for our veteran watchers? So oftentimes veterans will receive a copy of their exam and unfortunately it will be unfavorable. Yep. Um, and so I think at that point they need to keep in mind that they can certainly submit a response as we were just um, speaking about. Um, either pointing out any inadequacies or pointing out problems with the process. Um, perhaps maybe uh, the exam didn't go into a lot of detail or support any of the conclusions that were included in the exam. Mm -hmm. um, but also I think it's important for veterans just to keep in mind that while VA does hold the CMP exam, the VA exam, uh, or give it a lot of weight, it's only one piece of evidence. And so I think veterans should feel like they can and they should go out and obtain you know, treatment records, maybe their private treatment records, uh, a separate opinion that contradicts the findings of the CMP examination. Um, so I think if you get a decision, or rather if you get a um, examination report and it's unfavorable, um, it's not the end of the world, but I think the veteran should look to supplementing the record with other evidence that is favorable and sure. trying to show that this evidence does exist that contradicts what's in the examination. Because VA isn't supposed to just be giving more credence or more weight to a VA examination simply because it was performed by right. a VA examiner. Exactly. Unfortunately, I think sometimes in practice they do, but mm -hmm. absolutely are 100% right that they're not supposed to. Um, and that's why the outside evidence, and that's where the outside evidence comes into play. Um, so getting a private examination from maybe your treating physician, um, have them review the CMP exam. If, if they're willing to do so um, and, and submitting a response on your behalf. I think that's a good practical piece of advice. So Jenna alluded to this a little earlier. So let's <laughs> say you show up to your compensation and pension examination, right? Yep. You have a left knee disability um, and you're being seen by a toxicologist or a someone in the uh, you know cancer treatment department at a VA medical hospital. Mm -hmm. Is there a problem with that? So the first thing you should do is still attend the exam. Yeah. Don't, don't walk out. Don't Good walk advice. out just because you have somebody that's not a special a specialist in the area um, or on the disability that you're claiming. But yeah, that is you know that can be a problem. Yep. Um, and so if that is the case, veterans should afterwards uh, either request a copy of the CMP examiner's um, CV or resume mm -hmm. uh, to see exactly what the qualification of that of that CMP examiner is. And if we, if you find that the qualifications um, really don't seem like they would meet the disability or relate to the disability that you're claiming, I would suggest submitting a response to the CMP examination 
um, just pointing that out. Um, because really, VA is required to provide someone to evaluate the condition that has some medical background or expertise in okay. that area, generally speaking. So what about a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant? So th those are examples where that would likely be Probably be okay, okay right? Yeah. Um, unless the nurse practitioner or the physician's assistant had wholly unrelated experience. At or it was this very specific right. medical concept, like, right. a, like, like a toxic TBI, exposure case or... Traumatic brain injury, yeah. sometimes um, some sort, some types of, you know, psychiatric uh, conditions, the examination instructions will Must, ex right, explicitly yeah. list the type of specialist that is needed for that particular opinion. Um, you know, the, the thought process is, like I mentioned earlier, this is a complex area, um, a medically, you know, complex question that the board member or VA who's, you know, a, a VA employee, you know, probably went to college, probably got a job, but is not a medical expert, sure. does not know how to answer. And so that's why they want an expert. But if you're getting a medical professional who has completely unrelated experience in a very complex area of law, they're no better at making that opinion than the board member or the VA mm -hmm. employee. They're similarly situated. And yeah. so you really, you can read the VA exam instructions. And if they say that you need, you know, I believe it's like a neurologist mm -hmm. sometimes, sometimes a, a neuropsychiatrist, mm -hmm. certain things like that, then that's when you want to challenge it yeah. if it has just a PA or an NP. It would more likely be a successful challenge. Mm -hmm. um, so something you had, had mentioned, Mike, is uh, maybe getting some of your own evidence. Um, we had mentioned DBQs before. Would it make sense for a veteran that wanted to submit some of their own evidence um, to have someone fill out a DBQ form on their behalf? Sure. I think if a veteran has a treating physician that is willing to mm -hmm. do so, that it's always a better well, not always, but many times it's better for the veteran to have a physician who they're familiar with. Uh, presumably the physician knows the history, uh, the veteran's history. Mm -hmm. And so if the um, physician or nurse practitioner has experience with the veteran and they're willing to do it, I think having them fill out a DBQ form um, in place of maybe another exam would be a great thing sure. for them to do. And then again, um, just a reminder that although it's your treating physician, that doesn't automatically, there are some different areas of law where a treating physician sort of trumps all other medical experts or medical opinions. That doesn't happen in veterans law. Um, but the VA is supposed to consider it, give it as much weight um, based on, you know, how probative is, how, you know, probative is, uh, how, how well explained, things like that, how thoroughly done, that's sort of what mm -hmm. probative value means. Um, so we've been talking a lot about medical experts. Um, but there are uh, there's another sort of main type of expert in VA law, and that's a vocational expert. Um, so, what is a vocational expert? A vocational expert really is an expert in um, employment issues, if you will, mm -hmm. and they are able to better translate a veteran's disabilities into how those disabilities impact the veteran's ability to work. Okay. Um, and the key term for veterans law is substantially gainful employment. Mm -hmm. So they're really looking at how all the service-connected disabilities in particular translate into limitations, functional limitations on the veterans ability to to work in different in different capacities. Mm -hmm. And so vocational experts are not medical experts, they have a different set of uh, expertise and so they're really looking at um, the case as a whole in terms of all of the service-connected conditions instead of maybe one in particular and translating that into uh, ability to, to work. Where does one find a voc expert? Um, so vocational experts can be found, um, you know, there are several people that are spe really specialized in this area mm -hmm. and, um, you know, different offices and representatives have um, contacts with those, sure. with those offices. But if a veteran's unrepresented, if sure. they're on their own and they wish to seek out vocational experts, um, you know, a lot of times they can do so. I would recommend by using the internet, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, sure. yeah. Um, you know, just practically speaking, yeah. um, there are a lot of good resources out there for veterans to take a look at. And um, a lot of times the interviews don't need to be done in person. They can mm -hmm. be done over the phone. And so, um, but I think it's really important in cases dealing with unemployability issues 
for veterans to seek out those type of experts um, because they're just going to be able to provide an opinion that is uh, far more probative and on point than, say, uh, your regular medical examiner. Sure, mm -hmm. yeah, because they can say, because your knee pain makes it difficult for you to sit and stand, you can only do so for so long, this equates to this amount of occupational impairment or potentially complete limits. occupational exactly. impairment or certain limits and uh, which would narrow your job and abilities. It, that's exactly right and it's important too that um, these experts really are able to look at all service-connected disabilities mm -hmm. whereas maybe um, you know an orthopedic uh, expert opinion would only be able to focus very narrowly on sure. those type of disabilities. Right. A vocational experts going to be able to look at um, a wide array of different types of disabilities and as you said translate that into um, their impact on the veteran's ability to be employed. I think it's important to highlight too, you know, especially uh, situations that deal with individual unemployability, you know, mm -hmm. trying to get that 100% rating based on your inability to work, you know, it's really helpful to have a representative. Sure. And so, you know, if you are a veteran who is unrepresented and trying to, you know, find a vocational expert on your own and then, you know, navigate that whole veterans benefit system it can be really overwhelming. Absolutely. And so it's really important to, you know, reach out to your VSOs, reach out to, you know, any of the number of really well qualified attorneys mm -hmm. um, who can help you kind of um, figure out the best way to make that argument and find the best vocational expert for your particular situation absolutely yeah that's that's a great point point. and um, when you when you do find somebody it's good to keep in mind that they are allowed to and it's a good idea to have them review any mm -hmm. previous compensation and pension exam. Really sure. really good. yeah um, and you know they can take a look at it and offer uh, findings that may contradict what the VA examiner found and that can help and benefit your case for sure so thus far, we've been talking about a lot of the things that veterans should do in the context of a CMP examination. What's uh, don't, Jenna? What's something that a veteran shouldn't do? Yeah, so I think the first thing that you shouldn't do is uh, you shouldn't downplay your symptoms. I think a lot of veterans, particularly some of the older veterans, were mm -hmm. raised um, or brought up in this culture of you know being stoic. Um, you know, kind of we see a lot of cases um, come through our office where the veterans didn't were um, taught not to complain about yep. anything. Um, and, you know, to really pretend like everything's okay, even though they are in a lot of pain or even though, you know, their disability really affects their daily life. And so um, I think that Mike, you know, raised this earlier when he was talking about being honest and being expressive. You know, the flip side of that is don't downplay it. Don't pretend like you're okay. You know, don't tell the examiner that you can manage when you're really struggling. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I was looking at a veteran's case today and he um, mentioned something called the warrior ethos and so it's really mm -hmm. this you know um, mindset that veterans um, you know are really tough and yep. so um, that's not gonna help you get higher yeah. compensation yeah. so that's really important any thoughts Mike yeah I, we touched on this a little bit earlier mm -hmm. but um, just in terms of making sure that what you say is an accurate reflection of what's actually happening um, you know you don't want to exaggerate your symptoms mm -hmm. just because you think um, you know that maybe the VA won't understand the severity of them you want to because that, that's going to be reflected on the record in the record and um, if there's something previously that was recorded that contradicts with what you're saying now that mm -hmm. can cause a problem in terms of credibility issues in the future um, and so I think you know don't downplay your symptoms don't exaggerate yep. your symptoms really you know I, I would say be honest as uh, be as honest as possible during mm -hmm. the examination um, and I think you'll be okay yeah, and I think, um, you know, it's hard because exams are conducted on a single day. And yep. so, um, you know, you might be feeling okay on that one day that you go to an exam, but the examiner isn't your treating physician. And so they really only have the information that you're giving them. Yep. Um, and so if you, you know, go to an exam on a Wednesday, but that particular, that past Monday, it was a really, really bad day, you want to explain that. And mm -hmm. you kind of want to talk to the veteran or to the examiner about, um, 
the whole like history of you know your particular disability and do you have flare-ups does you know is it really worse in the morning versus is it better in the afternoon um a lot of veterans you know especially ones with physical disabilities have um you know changes in severity with seasons the seasons yeah and so um it's really important to you know when you're when we're saying don't exaggerate don't um don't downplay just but also you know explain kind of how it goes up and down if it does yeah, be as truthful and mm-hmm. as comprehensive as possible. Mm-hmm. I think that's the name of the game. Um, so, do you guys have any final thoughts on uh, advice that you'd have for veterans navigating the CMP process? I would just say that it is. Unfortunately, we see veterans frequently that, understandably, are frustrated um, that they have to get scheduled for yet another CMP exam. Mm-hmm. They've had a CMP exam on the same condition many times before. Sure. Why do I need to attend another exam on the same condition? Um, But as we spoke to earlier, it really is important that you go to the examination um, and that you are there to be able to accurately relay any information, uh, any additional information, new information, or just repeat the same old information. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, VA really will use a missed examination as an opportunity to deny your claim. Um, So I just can't stress that enough. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're going to multiple exams, there's a couple of different reasons for that. Either, you know, VA has decided that the previous exams you went to weren't adequate Mm -hmm. or, you know, they're trying to get an updated um, understanding of how your disability has changed since that past exam. And so it's always good to look at it as um, it's better to go to a new exam and make sure that VA has the most accurate information rather than get a denial. So I think that's the best thing. Yeah, there you know, an unfavorable CMP examination is not the end of the road. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of options that you have to deal with that. Um, As we said, either adding additional evidence or making legal arguments against the sufficiency of the examination. Um, But it's more important to get the examination done and completed than um, not go out of fear of an unfavorable uh, examination report. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, guys. Again, uh, my name is Christian McTarnigan, and I'm here with Jenna Zellmer and uh, Michael Lestrato. We're three attorneys at Chisholm, Chisholm, and Kilpatrick, and thanks for joining us today.